All right, it is the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, we are going to be discussing tools for increasing participation in 2021. We have three of our wonderful certified educators, Jennifer, Jessica, and um, oh my gosh, why am I? <laughs> And um, Nikki Jones, I'm so sorry, Nikki, I, I knew your name, but for some reason I had a brain lapse in that moment. <laughs> but um, they will be discussing how they increase participation in their um, classrooms, both um, digitally and in person. So we're thrilled to have everyone in our audience today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're gonna start with housekeeping and polls and then Nikki will take over and talk about virtual engagement. Um, then Jennifer is going to talk about gamification, uh, Flipgrid and Jamboard. And then Jessica is going to talk about um, conversations for remote learners and literacy skills. Um, and then we'll wrap up with Q&A um, and our giveaway. So, um, with our housekeeping items, um, we just want to let everyone know that the slides and the recording will be available after the webinar um, ends. Uh, uh, if you opt in for updates, um, you'll be emailed um, the webinar recording and the slides, and you can do that um, at the bottom of the Ozabot website. Also, our YouTube channel and our webinar page will have the recordings and the slide decks as well. Um, everyone's camera is off and you are on mute, um, but we'd love for you to participate in the conversation um, through Q&A if you have any questions or in the chat if you're just um, sharing ideas or wanting some thought partnership, feel free to um, send a message um, to, again, all panelists and attendees um, in that two field. I see some people are um, sending it to just the panelists, um, but we'd love everyone to be able to see their messages. So um, select all panelists and attendees. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to use the Q&A um, option at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be going to Q&A at the end, and, and that will ensure that we, your question doesn't get lost in the chat. Um, you can also upvote and comment on each other's questions um, with your own insights in the Q&A. Um, and we have our Ozbot staff member, uh, Cassandra, who's going to be helping us monitor the chat. So thank you, Cassandra, for doing that. Um, with our uh, this webinar, we are giving away an educator entry kit. So you can go to ozo.bot slash giveaway. Um, Cassandra, do you know if that survey is open? Um, yes, I'll post the link right now. Perfect, great. Um, so you will be putting in your name and your email address. Um, there is only one entry per attendee. If you do enter multiple times, it will be disqualified and we will announce the winner at the end of the webinar. Um, so go ahead and fill that out for your chance to win and we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I am the host today, Melissa Tui. Um, I will be taking a back seat and handing it over to Nikki, Jennifer, and Jessica um, as they will be sharing the content of what they do in their classrooms and in their schools. Um, but I am the ed tech and adoption specialist here at Ozabot. I'm a former teacher and um, I'm pursuing my doctoral degree at UCLA um, where I'm studying uh, computer science implementation in elementary school settings. So um, really excited that everyone is here joining us to learn more about a technology integration. And I'll pass it to Nikki to introduce herself. Hi, I am Nikki Jones and I am an instructional technology coach in Northern Virginia. Formerly, I've taught first and third grade, so I have a lot of experience in the classroom. This is my 15th year, and I'm really passionate about computer science education and all things technology, so I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for including me, Melissa, and Jennifer for inviting me. Absolutely, and we'll uh, pass it to Jennifer to introduce herself. There we go. Hello, my name is Jennifer Mahan, and I am a technology integration specialist and a kindergarten through fifth grade STEM teacher at East Elementary School in Belleville, Kansas. And last but not least, I'm Jessica, if you could introduce yourself. Hey there, I'm Jessica Talley and a K2 technology teacher and coordinator in Southwest Arkansas. And I've taught for 14 years. In the last three of those, I've been in the technology lab. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. I, I'm so thrilled to be featuring all three of you and sharing um, with the audience all the incredible things that you are all doing in the classroom. So with that, um, we're going to launch some poll questions just so the panelists can have a better idea of who's in the audience. 
Uh, let me look for my Zoom bar so that I can start the poll. Um, we would love to know how familiar everyone is with Ozobot. Um, the content that's being covered today is not necessarily Ozobot focused, but we're just interested to know who here is familiar with Ozobot and who is um, unfamiliar with Ozobot. And we'll give everyone about 15 more seconds to answer that poll. About five more seconds. All right, great. It looks like most people have Ozobots or are familiar um, uh, or know people that use them. So that's really great. Um, we'd love to know what grade level everyone is teaching currently. Um, and we'll give everyone about 30 seconds to fill out that whole question. All right, and it looks like our audience is um, K through eight, um, and we're pretty evenly split across um, K to two, three to five, and six to eight. So that's really exciting to hear. Um, I think the content that um, our panelists will be sharing today is gonna be easily adjustable for all the grade levels that are here today. So that's really exciting to see. And the last thing we'd love to know is what subjects you are most interested in teaching. We'll give about 20 more seconds to answer that full question. All right, and it looks like um, everyone's here for technology or a lot of people are here for technology and then engineering and art. So I think you will find a lot of useful tools um, that our panelists will be sharing. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Nikki, who is our first uh, presenter. Nikki, would you like to share your screen or would you like me to click through as you speak? What would you prefer? I can share my screen because I think I'm gonna move pretty quickly and I don't wanna to have to keep telling you to click away. So I have it up and ready to go. Hello again, everyone. Oh gosh, I these Zoom controls, no matter how many times I use them, I feel like I am still learning. So here we go. Nope. Oh, it's locked on here. Okay. So like Melissa said, I am Nikki Jones and I am an instructional technology coach. Tonight, the things that I wanted to share with you when I started putting a list together, I was grabbing resources and I had a long list of things that I wanted to share. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to share some really inspiring, inspiring educators that are on Twitter that are constantly sharing this content that is free and engaging. So I, I have a long list. You can take a screenshot, but I'm gonna go through and share each of these educators and some of the content that they share. And I'm kind of gonna set it up for Jennifer and Jessica because some of the content that is shared they're going to talk a little bit more about um, with Jamboards and Flipgrid a little bit later on. So let's get started. We're going to start with Mrs. Park Shine. She is an ELA teacher turned instructional designer and she shares amazing Jamboards in Google. So she has a lot of content that is for building that social emotional learning that we know right now is so important. And she has some check-ins, a lot of games, and then also templates that can be used for kind of any grade level. So the content that I wanted to share with you, I wanted it to be able to go across multiple grade levels because I'm working with K-5. A lot of what I do is adaptable and some of these things can easily be put into any classroom. And I wanted to, to have things that you could take away right now and start tomorrow. So if you are feeling so inclined and you want to try the check-in I have a tiny URL that I will pop into the chat you don't need to do it and we're not going to take time to really go over it but it is a jam board if you just wanted to see kind of what it looks like and it is a Wednesday and it just says what is your day been like check in with a meme 
Um, this is really fun and engaging for students. So Jamboard is really easy. And Jennifer, I know, is going to talk a little bit more about it in a little bit. All right. Person number two, come on, Google, is Matt Miller. Um, he is an author and an educator. He is the author of Ditch That Textbook, and he just held Ditch Summit. It's a once a year, kind of like an unconference, and it's some of the best PD that I've ever attended and was so excited about. A lot of his Twitter content that he shares is blog post, and he has a lot of, um, his learning is really focused on getting away from using worksheets in the classroom and how to integrate technology in a meaningful and engaging way. And he also spends a lot of time getting it relevant to kids. So we know that our kids are on these social media websites. We know that they're on TikTok and Pinterest and Instagram and all of these different things. So he actually shares a lot of really cool ways to kind of mimic those without having the kids actually be on those websites. Um, so I think that's really cool about him and he again he's just one of those contagious infectious personalities that when you see him speak you just like want to hear more from him so matt miller is our second presenter or our second twitter handle the third one is megan I don't know how to say her last name, Veniza, Venezia. She shares a ton of social emotional learning content, um, morning meeting slides, and even if you don't use all of the exact way that she has it structured. I like to use it just to get ideas for questions and things that she shares. And then there's also, this is the picture of the day. I'm gonna drop this link in the chat for you as well. Maybe I'm not. Um, it is a check-in basically, and you can pull content easily to this. So it's using a Jamboard. You can change and manipulate the picture. So the one that I have for you is actually a picture of some students using Ozobots. And I'm gonna put it in the chat, but not right now because that is not letting me copy it. Um, and then she also shares a lot of so like rewarding students. So this is like a virtual high five to kids or some kind of award. So I really like the content that she shares. Our next one is the Merrills. I feel like if you are in education, you know who they are. They just came out with a brand new book. It's called Flipgrid in the Interactive Classroom. And they are also all about just having engagement and interactive classes using Flipgrid in these creative project-based learning kind of ways. And they are also really into this relevant learning. Um, one of their newest blog posts is about how to play Among Us on Flipgrid. This is when I know that I'm like too old and the kids don't think you're cool anymore. I tried to download Among Us. I have no idea. Like I just don't get it, but the kids do and they love it. So I have that bookmarked to come back to, to try to find a way to get that integrated into the classroom because right now more than ever, we need that engagement piece. And I feel like so many educators are, or a lot of educators are falling back onto those worksheets that they know how to do and they can put those into Canvas and they can make it work. And we need to do more than that and we need to do better. And I feel like the Merrill's are really advocating for that. And they also share these, I think up here, oh, that picture got deleted, the one minute PDs. They often post these really awesome, super fast one minute PDs. And it's just a great idea. So one was showing how to use Flipgrid as a stop motion video. One was showing how to use Flipgrid as a spelling test for little learners. So there's just lots of really cool ideas that the Merrills have keep going. Carly and Adam, these two share tons of STEM learning. Lots of it is hands-on and they will share um, things like this that's like a build and then they also share things that are using Ozobots or using Flipgrid for STEM. So I really just like them. Lots of creative ideas. They also share tons of freebies and really just great content for educators. The other thing they share is a lot of projects that kids actually do. So sometimes I just think it's good to get your brain thinking about how different things can be used when you actually see it in action. And I really like that about their blog or that they will retweet certain things 
um, projects that other people have done. Gifted Talk, this educator, her name is Julia, and she is absolutely amazing. She is kind of the queen of Jamboards and in integrating STEAM and STEM into them. She also shares a lot of these math puzzles and kind of critical thinking, getting kids um, just engaged with math and thinking about different things. So she shares a lot of free content and then she also retweets ideas and other people's stuff so i thought these are really cool because they're great easily integrated into any grade level any subject and the one that's kind of blowing up right now is the um this is using it to make a mosaic so for area and perimeter for measurement there's just so many content areas that you can pull into her jam boards and they're easily adaptable to make it fit your grade level. If you're working with a second grade and you're, you know, this one, for example, is money, you can change the money to be 50 cents, 25 cents, a dollar. If you work with a higher grade level and you need to add making change, you can adapt it and, and make the ice cream cone worth a dollar 29 and add in some of those um, word problems and different things with it. So she has a lot of free content. She actually just started a link tree. So she's sharing all of her things on there and you can get and make a copy really easily of her. This next guy is Jarrett Lerner. He is an author and he is also just sharing amazing free content. He does a lot of open-ended student responses. So finish the comic, draw this, design things, build certain things. Um, just that has a lot of really creative and critical thinking skills. So his website has all of these as downloadable PDFs and you can easily share them or integrate them. You know, if you do a slide deck or if you use an LMS system or Seesaw and put them through there, but he is definitely worth a follow on Twitter. My Apple Watch is not telling me my time, so I feel like I'm racing, but I wanna make sure I get to everybody and give everybody their time. So Christine K. Dixon, she is an amazing educator. She is sharing tons of STEAM challenges. And right now she actually has 22 that you can download from her Weebly website. And you can also adapt these. So they are a lot focused on holidays or different things that are going on. Um, and I just think that she is really relevant right now because we have a lot of kids at home and this is a great way to get them doing STEAM at home, especially if that's something that's new to you. It's a great starting point for ideas, even if you don't use her full process just to kind of get the ideas flowing. I feel like she's a really great resource for that. Tracy Piltz, she is another amazing educator. She shares a weekly techie news. And on her techie news, she has these just little tidbits. And I really just like the way her writing style and that she just has four things. This is what her newsletter always looks like. And it always has links to whatever she's suggesting that teachers try. So she is another really awesome follow. Um, she works with, I believe, K2. And so she has some of that focus on the littles where I feel like sometimes we lack and we think that they can't do it because they're too little. So she has a lot of those ideas um, to integrate into those lower classrooms. And then this is the Ozo Squad. So there are lots of there are lots of people in this community. But if you follow that hashtag that I realized I just spelled wrong and put an extra Q in, so we'll delete that. Um, but if you follow that hashtag Ozo Squad, if you are new to Ozobot, even if you're not new to Ozobot, I think that this is my biggest way to learn is to follow these people and these hashtags on Twitter. And this is where I get a lot of inspiration and ideas from. The lesson library is fabulous in the Ozobot community, but sometimes if I see an idea, I can twist it to fit my curriculum and make it work. So Jennifer, who's going to be pre presenting in a couple of minutes, she is constantly sharing STEM content and how she does the Ozobots. One of my favorite things that she did this year is the Macy's Day Parade. It was huge. A lot of educators did it, but I just love the way that she shares her content. 
Renee Perry, she is working with, I don't know what grade level, K-5 maybe? No, six even, because she had something for sixth graders the other day. She's doing an awesome job just sharing out everything that she's doing and having kids doing. And like I said, even if you don't use her exact idea, sometimes just scrolling through her feed gives me inspiration or gives me ideas to do something else. Lisa Richardson, she is an awesome resource for um, upper elementary and high school math. She's been sharing, she presented with me um, last year, I think, on a math Ozobot webinar. And I just think she has a lot of really great ideas. So she is another really awesome one to follow. And then Adam Hill, I actually watched an Ozobot set webinar with him. Um, and they have piloted the one-to-one -one program and he just shares a lot of really awesome content and ideas. So those are my top four Ozo Squad. Like I said, there are tons more, but those are the four that I feel like I'm constantly, if I need some inspiration or ideas that I go to. So thanks so much, Melissa. I hope that everyone finds this kind of helpful. If you are not on Twitter, this is the PSA, like you need to get there. Even if you don't post just to surf through what other educators are doing. Um, I get most of my ideas and creativity and just energy, I think, from these other like-minded educators. So if you're not there and you need help getting there, I'm happy to do that. But these are some really awesome educators that you need to follow. Amazing. Thank you, Nikki. Yes. And um, we also, as a, as a team at Ozabot, love to see everything that um, teachers do with Ozabot and just ed tech in general. So feel free, if you have any questions about um, Twitter or that community, let us know in Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I believe Jennifer's up next. So um, Jennifer, would you like to share your screen? Yes, I will share my screen. Hello. Um, I think I need Nikki to stop sharing her screen. <laughs> Um, oh, well, sorry. I am like in my emails. <laughs> ah, I can't find it. There we go. Am I sharing my screen with everyone? Okay, yes, sorry uh, for all. Yep. <laughs> sorry for all the other screens I just decided to show you, but you know. <laughs> so, uh, like I said earlier, my name is Jennifer Mahan. I'm a technology integration specialist and a, a K through five STEM teacher. And I just want to talk to you about some of my favorite ways to engage students. Um, so the first one I'm going to start with is gamification. And I guess I should say before I became a STEM teacher and tech integration specialist, I was a special ed teacher for three years. And I also taught uh, fifth grade math and social studies for three years. And I feel like a lot of my experiences and where I want to go with teaching educators about how to use technology <laughs> comes from my experience as a fifth grade teacher. And one of my favorite things that I did was gamification. And I guess at the time I didn't even realize I was doing gamification, but I was. <laughs> and one thing I 100% believe is when you are teaching, don't just teach, create an experience for your students um, and try to find ways to relate to them. And one way is kids are really into gaming and you wanna build those connections with your students. You wanna make education engaging for them. And this is one way you can do that is with game-based learning it definitely enhances learning through exploration and play. Um, it gives students that idea that they can level up and you can pretty much hack any game. So when I was a fifth grade teacher, I hated assessments <laughs> um, and reviewing for them was not always fun and teaching math and social studies, it was hard subjects. So I started all my reviews basically turned into either doing Flipgrid or some sort of gamification. And I actually went and typed in every review question usually into quizzes and um, created, you know, games to review. And the students worked in pairs, they were collaborating, and they loved that you could like level up or you had that game mode in quizzes. You had the memes, it made it fun. Um, and I don't think my students always thought about it as a review. They were learning, they were working with their peers, and they were getting so much more out of if I was just giving those students a worksheet. Um, so you can do this with content that you're already doing. And like I said, I did that all the time. My reviews were either quizzes or some sort of Jeopardy. And it was a way for students to be engaged, to be learning, and 
just to have fun with what we were doing. So I think it was more memorable for them and they probably learned the facts a little differently. Um, and it really allowed my students to take ownership in what they're doing and especially when you let them help create games. So I actually started the first 10 to 15 minutes of every single class um, with some sort of game to review math facts and it worked. It was, it definitely helped them. Um, and some ways you can do this is by letting students create their own games and use games you already have. So you could easily let students put their own adjectives into apples to apples. You could create your own Uno cards. Um, like I said, Jeopardy, I did that all the time. Play a digital game, Kahoot, Quizzes, Quizlet, or Breakout EDU. And, and this is an awesome one that I never did, but I think it'd be great for students. Create a quest over a semester. So have them earn points as they, through that whole semester, you know, have them get badges. And that's another thing too, like you could easily do a badging system with gamification for students and students will want to earn badges and level up and share those badges and it'll be like another sort of an accomplishment for them. So one thing I've really been into lately, um, and if you follow me on Twitter, I'm sorry, I love um, digital escape rooms. And what I love about these is you can make them about any content area that you are already doing. So I teach STEM in my classroom. Um, so I do a lot with technology, science, math, engineering, all of that stuff. So I make digital escape rooms about coding, whether it's Blockly, binary, um, or JavaScript coding. I can take the content we're already learning and put it into some sort of game, some sort of puzzle. So if you're not familiar with digital escape rooms, it is a place where Students have to unlock puzzles and clues and break out of basically a classroom. And I make them using uh, Google drawings, uh, Google Forms, and sites. And I build it all together. And then my students get to collaborate with their peers. And the thing I love about this is I don't have all of my students in class with me. Some of them, I mean, we are in person, but I have remote learners. I have kids who are quarantined. And this is a great activity because my in-class learners can actually be working through Google Meet with my remote learners and they can, you know, be solving this in real time together. So here are just some examples of ones that I've done. I like to do them for holidays, but you can also do any subject you're teaching, make one for that subject. And it's a great way for students to review their skills. Um, so basically students solve a series of tasks and puzzles to gain passwords and clues. It's a great way to increase your student engagement and it allows students to collaborate while hunting for clues and solving puzzles. And I will say when you first do this, it with students, I did them with third through fifth grade and it was hard. Um, they wanted me to give them every answer because they didn't know where to look and where to solve these puzzles. But after the first two times, they love to do them and I have fun with them. <laughs> So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is probably one of my favorite tools to use to increase student engagement, and that is Flipgrid. If you are not familiar with Flipgrid, it is a video recording platform, but it is so much more. It has interactive um, whiteboards and blackboards and stickers. You can do screen recording. You can literally, if you can, it, it's everything. <laughs> but it's a great way to empower students, to give your students a voice. Um, and I actually started using this when I was a fifth grade math teacher because formative assessment was not fun. And I had my students uh, do review questions on Flipgrid. They would show how they solved their problem. And then they went home that night and they watched those videos for hours on end. It was crazy the amount of time my students spent watching math videos. Um, I, looking back now, they related to it. They, were, they thought they were YouTubers. They thought they were, um, you know, but they were learning. They were watching their classmates. And what I like too, my students who are at home now, they can participate. They can share their Flipgrid videos. My students in the classroom can respond. I can respond. Um, I was home for a few weeks this school year sick, and I was actually able to see what my students were doing in the classroom. They were doing a STEM project, and they were recording their videos. I could respond, um, and I could do it all from home, which was even better. Uh, so it really builds that sense of community. It builds that that collaboration with kids. It lets kids show you what they're doing in a different way. And I mean, I learned so much about my students doing this and my students love doing Flipgrid. I have some of those uh, green voice pods. So if you're familiar with Flipgrid, you probably know what those are. And I am in like a hallway by myself. <laughs> and when students around that corner and see my Flipgrid voice pods, they are 
so pumped because they know what they're going to be doing. They know they're going to be sharing all sorts of things. So some ways you can use Flipgrid, um, virtual field trips, Grid Pals, which is like um, kind of like an online pen pal, I guess you could say. You can share your aha, aha moments. You can check in with kids. You can do peer reviews, school announcements. Um, it's great for like podcasting uh, because there's just a mic feature. You can do science fair projects, reviews for anything. Awesome for formative assessment. Um, we've seen digital concerts being done that way. Great for icebreakers, goal setting, blogs, um, and daily check-ins. One of my favorite features is probably the Flipgrid AR code. After you create a video, you can print out this code and um, using the Flipgrid app, it is augmented reality. So when you scan that code, your video pops out, it comes to life, it's interactive. Um, and it's super fun and the kids love to share their work that way. So Flipgrid's just a great way to showcase student work, to collaborate. Um, you can do interactive choice boards and with the code you can do um, keepsakes. But the best part is there's over 25,000, probably more than that, um, pre-made ideas in the discovery library. So you can just quickly hop on there, find an activity and fit it into your classroom. Um, so I love it for that portion too. <laughs> so some ways that I have used this in my classroom, roll for a question with Flipgrid. I created kind of like a dice and I can put my own, the performative assessment again, I can put my own review questions on that dice. Students can roll it, scan it with an iPad or their Chromebook, any device really, and it would take them to a question. So I have some question examples over there that we've done. I've done this for math. I've done this with Ozobots. I've done this with different STEM projects. Um, and I can create the questions, students can respond to them. Another way that you can do this is you can have students create their own questions under a Flipgrid topic, and then I can print the QR codes, make a dice, and you can have your students creating the questions and now students responding to each other. So it's kind of giving them more ownership, it's giving them more excitement when they see that their question was picked for the dice. Um, you can do one to two questions, have students answer all the questions. There are so many different ways you can do this. Um, like I said, I really like the augmented reality portion and I do that a lot in STEM. So I have a code here just to show you what they look like. Um, and I had some students explain their favorite color code for Ozobots and then I printed those out. Kids could go around and scan them and obviously then they're like, oh, well that kid likes tornado, I like tornado. And then they'd have to show you their different codes. And it was just a really great way for students to show what they know and to empower them. Um, I like to attach them to all and any projects we do. It's a great way for students to collaborate and share what they've done. And I love to use it for small groups. So I have like an example here of an Ozobot worksheet. And I actually, I think we're covering it, but there is a QR code underneath there. And students can scan it and they can um, learn what they're doing in that station or that area by themselves. So it gives students some independence. And I don't have to sit there and tell them, hey, this is what we're doing. You can scan the code, you can do it yourself. And it gives younger students that ownership that, you know, and especially if I'm busy, it's, it's a great way for students to move on without me. Um, when I do STEM challenges, we'll put those QR codes on their projects and kids go by and scan them um, and they get to learn about what other kids did. So I did a pumpkin elevator from third through fifth grade. When we put those QR codes on, I now have cross, um, grade level collaboration and kids are learning how, oh, well this kid did her, his like this and you're learning from each other. And it's just a great way to present projects, to share ideas. There's so, so many ways you can use this. Um, and then I have another example there. I like to put them in the hallway and I have seen students during like back to school night or parent teacher conferences, run in with their parents, drag them to my classroom, scan those codes. You know, I've seen custodians in the hallway scanning those codes to see you know, my students' creations come to life. And it's just a great way to represent what we're doing. And the next thing I wanna talk about is Jamboards. If you have not heard about Jamboard, it is awesome. It's a free Google tool. It's a collaborative whiteboard, but it's so much more. It's an engaging visual learning tool, I guess you could say. It's super interactive. Um, and I've had some people ask me like, what's the difference between Google Slides and Jamboards? If you want anything to move, if you want it to be interactive, you should be using Jamboards. You can draw and annotate frames, you can share jams, you can, and like Nikki said, uh, there's so many templates out there. Matt Miller has some really great templates available. Um, this is a great way to share social, the social emotional learning pieces. Um, 
any subject this fits with. You can add sticky notes, drawings, text, and more. Uh, you can insert images. You can collaborate in real time. The only thing that I don't love about this is you can't always, you can't see the version history, so you can't see exactly who has done what. Um, you can drag and resize anything. You can share it. There's so many ways to do it. Class debates, math discussions. Uh, you could do your lunch count this way, do check-ins. Um, there's, there's, there's a great way to like the fist of five, three things that stood out from you in this lesson, just post images, science experiments, anything that you can collaborate and you can do as a team, as a community, you can do it with Jamboards. Um, so this is one of probably my newer favorite tech tools that I just think it's a great way to engage students, to get them excited about learning. So these are just, I mean, I could go on forever, but these are a few of my favorite tech tools. So that is all I have to share. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jennifer. That was so exciting just to hear about the engagement and how even the janitors were, you know, invested in the kids learning. I mean, it just speaks to how meaningful and how exciting the content that you're sharing and creating for your students is. Um, and we'll go ahead and pass it over to Jessica. Okay, I will attempt to share my screen. Give me just a second. And see how this will go. Okay, um, as I said before, uh, Jessica Talley, I'm from Arkansas, and I've been a K-2 technology teacher for three years now. And so um, I taught second grade uh, for the other years that I've taught. And um, one thing that our school has really picked up on the last couple of years is, is how our reading program, we've realized how important it is for us to have um, just the conversations and to get those young learners started with um, going deeper and being able to talk and have acquired that vocabulary like they need to and then um, work with the phonological awareness piece too so that they can become stronger readers. So um, those are what my slides are about. Um, I didn't do all of my slides um, with technology, but technology can be integrated into it in so many different ways. Um, as the other two mentioned, um, we use Seesaw a lot in our classrooms and um, we're a Microsoft school, so we use Teams a lot. So um, just integrating these with, you know, quick slideshows or um, different PowerPoint um, Seesaw activities where you could show these to your kids quickly. And so um, the first one that I wanted to talk about that we use a lot, we use classroom passwords a lot. And instead um, of- Jessica, if I could just interrupt really quickly, I wasn't sure if you were trying to share your screen, but we're not able to see oh, it if you- Oh are. dear. Well, sorry, well, sorry for interrupting. Sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me get back to that. Um, I might not have hit it all the way. Let's see. Did not. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me. See. Is that better? Yes, perfect. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no like problem. Said, Thank I, you. I'm used to um, Microsoft, and and I was getting a little nervous about going back to Zoom from the original. So let me get um, on uh, presenter mode. Got too many things going at one time. I think. Is that better? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Able to see All that. right. I'm so sorry. Um, so, but going back to the passwords, um, I just took a quick snapshot of one of my uh, peer teachers across the hall, one of our music teachers, and she always does a great job with changing out her passwords. And this one was just as simple as getting to know you, uh, getting to know your name and your number in, in class because we see so many students you know, getting, to, having to uh, remember all those names and those things at the beginning of the year is so important, but that just gives you um, and the kids a moment to talk, to speak, even right there at the door, and that's one of the first things that I think, you know, that just helps with that engagement, and um, it can be as simple as telling your favorite um, activity or color. Um, it can be assessments, you know, 
with smaller students, showing cards, um, computer parts that we've studied or parts of a book and just anything simple as that. So picture passwords for the younger learners um, tied to specific curriculum or vocabulary. And then um, I, I've done it before as icebreakers with my virtual students and just having it where they, they don't have to be afraid to talk right off the bat. And so um, passwords are some of my very favorites. And then um, moving on to um, photos too. And so I just um, took a few quick snapshots of different things that I've used. Um, I love Zoom, the zoomed in pictures and um, I link some down here at the bottom, but um, just having them talk about color and texture and things like that, that um, just get some just gets everybody in a, in a good conversation. And I just love some where they're just everybody's, oh yes, yes, I agree. And I think that that looks like this, what well, might be this, but um, just zoomed in pictures, pictures from read alouds and then um, hidden pictures too. So um, that's where I thought we could use, you know, it'd be easy for us to do in a seesaw activity or something for to have where everybody had their own and they could, say, okay, well, in this corner I see, or in, on the le left or right-hand side, I see this. And so um, you can tie in technology easily there as well. But um, different things to do with the pictures, you know, you could talk about labeling and show them how to do that through Seesaw. Um, having dialogue, you know, what, what could be going on? What, what do you think they might be trying to tell or, um, you know what could be what could have gone on before this picture was taken different storylines and then just keep continued questioning so um one of the things that i really enjoy with this after we kind of do it for you know a good amount of time and the students are um familiar with it letting them film each other with pictures that they might find and um just letting them practice that way and keeping that conversation going and then um, I had some games and activities listed. Uh, which one doesn't belong? We do a lot of this with math, but we, we can tie it in so easily with um, just different picture cards. Um, I had just a little a sheet up there that I had found and they could tell, basically, as long as they can explain something that, in their opinion, ties two together that there's not really a wrong answer, whether it be, okay, well, these two are the same color or these two are animals, those sorts of things. And so that really, that gets a lot of um, higher order thinking too, because sometimes I would not think about, hey, you know, that's a pretty good idea. You, you did link those together. And you know, that, that makes them very, very proud to, to share with that. And then it, it just makes it more comfortable that, well, if they think that way, then I can think, you know, let me show you, show you what I think with it too. And so I just, that's one of my favorite things to do with conversations to have with them. And um, then I put on here feely bags and I'd taken a picture of an example that I had um, just kind of modeling, okay, this, I'm, I've got this in my bag and I'm going to reach in and okay, I want to explain it to you. And then you, you get to guess, but in a second, I'm going to hand you the bag. And so then you have to go ahead and, you know, you share something with it. So be thinking about what you think you feel, you know, those kind of things. And um, th that's just really fun to play with the kids and then telling um, stories using props and then posable figures, I, I, um, one of the websites that I've linked on one of these other slides has actually has some posable figures that they can go back and they can move on their own and then they could go and tell with a partner or a small group, they could talk about, okay, well, this is the storyline that goes with that. And um, I believe I skipped draw my picture, but um, there are so many fun things that you can do with that um, and tie in algorithms for computer science. And um, we also, we do a lot of um, muffalo potato and those sorts of things. And so uh, just getting those listening skills and having them where, okay, did your, did your picture turn out 
you know, like so and so your partners or across the way, why is why is yours a little bit different? Did you hear something different? And just having those conversations as well, I feel like it's really important. So, and then I moved on to um, just all kinds of movement. One of my favorite things, we always start my classes since they, they walk down the hall to me, um, they um, come in and we, we do a lot of either stand up whole body movement or hand movements and just kind of get everybody going that way. And then we could talk about, okay, can you do a movement similar to that, but explain how it might be a little different? Um, what, you know, talk about what part body parts you would change to make different sounds go with it and um so i really like the vocab building the vocabulary too um i had down here for um the word jam on go noodle just building that vocabulary and going with that they have some really good um slides that you can do and you can make your own so i just think that that's really good and then uh, the hand movement movements that I have, I'm not going to play this video, but it's a video of my um, teacher across the hall, and she is doing all kinds of hand movements with um, their our phonemic awareness materials. And so just so that they hear those sounds, you know, having not only just the fingers for the different sounds that you hear, but um, punching up, you can um, pulling the hands down and just the different movements like that to help with uh just adding that extra layer of hearing those sounds and adding to the phonemic awareness that we do so um i will kind of go ahead and pause that and then move to that next slide but i as far as the technology i kind of threw that in on our last slides but online manipulatives for our phonemic awareness and being able to hear those um, sounds and help those young learners. The toy theater, uh, they have a lot of good uh, online manipulatives. The Elconin boxes where the kids can actually do on iPads. Um, dice for the games, the, any kind of vocabulary game or if you were like rolling for, um, rolling to draw, different things to create a character, if that sort of thing. We like using those toy theater, the dice on that. And then um, I also attached uh, the virtual teaching hub to help the, it has lots of phonemic awareness um, activities as well that you can pull in their different online manipulatives and they've got some really good resources. Um, as the other two mentioned, um, just filming of any kind. Uh, I'm sorry to say that I haven't got in Jen with um, the Flipgrid as I wanted to. I will work on it just for you. But um, just our video, you know, our simple videoing, especially the the youngers, um, just using our camera app. But they love, as far as going back to that conversation, they love to film and you know explain their thinking that sorts of way, that sort of way. And then we use Chatterpix a lot. Um, for our vocabulary and um, talking about those different things. And I just think that that's really fun. And then um, I have on the other side, just sharing online kits um, and materials that we have, our robotics, showing those to our digital learners. Um, they've really enjoyed being able to see what our in-person kids have. So, um, just sharing those. Um, Pit Collage has been been really big with me this year. Um, and then giving uh, little tutorials with those kind of things, sharing, sharing from there, sharing with our um, our virtual kids, having the in-person kids explain their thought processes and things that we've done. So um, I've enjoyed being able to link those with my um, virtual lessons that I've had. So that's a few of those things. And then um, I wanted to kind of end with our Ozobot and how it just adds, uh, I like how it adds another layer visually and kinesthetically with them putting it, putting it down. Um, and I just attached a phonological awareness uh, with the pictures that I had done for um, some of my littler kids before. So even if it's just 
you know, giving them something basic at the beginning, do they rhyme? Yes or no, and using just, you know, one straight color, you know, to kind of introduce Ozobot. Um, but it just, it helps them so much. I, I love the, I love just seeing it in their eyes, what they can do with it, and then moving on and doing the color codes and, and that stuff. So um, tracing the outlines to kind of add to um, something that we've learned for vocabulary, a vocabulary word. And um, I just, they've, it's always a big hit with them. So the last thing I just put on there, opportunities for more, just I, I've tried very hard this year, anytime that I have some extra time during uh, the four days that are not jam packed full, just going back and um, pulling in, you know, a student or two that I, I noticed maybe would have been, a, were a little bit quieter in my classes and um, just just talking with them, just saying, hey, you wanna check this out with me or would you like to go a little further? Let's, let's pull out some more of our robots and let's see, and going back and teaching them some of that vocabulary if there was a certain, certain thing that we had talked about that day and seeing what, you know, what they have to say about it. So just giving them time to talk and it's just, you know, we need it more than ever now, so. That is what I had. So I will stop sharing there. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, um, Jessica. That was really wonderful just to hear from all three of you and how you're implementing and getting creative. We know it's really, really challenging right now. And any way we can engage students in their learning and get them invested in their own learning is um, makes our job as educators easier. So um, with that, I would love to invite our attendees to submit any questions. Um, I think we had some in the chat, um, but also if you want to pop any into Q&A at this point, we can answer your questions. And some that came up, um, we were wondering, how do you engage students that may not have permission to video record themselves at home due to privacy? Um, how do you address those needs if, if you have students that, um, for whatever reason, aren't allowed to video record themselves? Do any of you have any suggestions or alternatives for students? So I'll just jump right in because I'm also a Flipgrid lover and they just launched a new feature where you can do mic only. You can also on Flipgrid, um, I've been using it for years, but this last year it's just been a game changer and been really critical. You can also put an emoji over your face. You can put the whole screen up. You can, I mean, there are many, many ways that you can address that when it's needed. I teach at a school with over 750 kids and we haven't had it as an issue. I think it's probably more of a scarce, you know, something that doesn't come up often, but if it does, there are ways around it. Jennifer or Jessica, do you have any thoughts you wanted to contribute? I think no. Nikki explained it really well. Um, the only thing that I would also add is What's great about it is there are these blackboard and whiteboard features and the mic only option. So if you choose to cover your face or not have that visual there, you can still engage by using the stickers, by drawing. There's so, so many features or just sharing your screen and not showing yourself. I have not ran into that issue either, but I have had students who are really shy and did not feel comfortable doing that. And they have um, like some blurred features too, filters. where it pretty much filters, yeah. Where you um, you're in the pixel filter. Yeah, so you can do all that stuff and you really can't see you. So I think there are ways around it and you could still use that great tool with your students. And it's interesting that you mentioned too about some shy students, Jennifer, because I've had some of the most shy students shine on Twitter or on Flipgrid. They, um, we're doing a creativity challenge right now at our school. It's a 10 day creativity challenge. And the STEAM coach and I have been collaborating on it. And she texted me earlier and she's like, D do you know who that is? And it's a girl that's a select mute at school. She does not speak at all at school, at all, since kindergarten. And she's a fourth grader and she was like, 
being a news broadcaster and she did an interview with a president the other day and just blew i mean she used the pause feature it blew my i was like no i don't think you have the right person um so some of those kids where i think in our mind we maybe are more reluctant to use it because we're like well what about these types of kids what about this i think we just have to put it out there for our kids and they will figure it out they found those features they find that emoji if they're not comfortable sharing their face they use those effects in those features and i don't even make a big deal about it as far as like teaching that they're there um, and they've found them. So I think that's just really cool to mention in Flipgrid. I know I talked about Twitter and getting on Twitter, but if you are not on Flipgrid, you need to get there. It was amazing before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, it is an absolute game changer for building those communities and that relationship. And there are just so many different ideas. So I can't say enough about Flipgrid. Wonderful. Uh, Jessica, I want to give you an opportunity to chime in as well if you had any thoughts, but no pressure if not. <laughs> uh, well, I was just going to say, what little that I do, I have used Flipgrid for, we did um, uh, a mask singer kind of thing when the pandemic first hit, and that was one feature, the stickers that in the pixelation, we did use that, and I, I told myself, I was like, oh, we've got to get into this, and I I love the idea of Flipgrid and I love like w looking at everything that Jen posts and has shared and all of those kind of things. It's just, I have gotten a little swamped being the coordinator as well. And so having to deal with and make sure that all of our iPads are running and all of that. But I do like you, like both of them said, um, the stickers and the pixelation, I, I definitely know that that would be something because I, I as well have a few students that, um, cannot be filmed or you know that are that are shy and I think that I could really see them shining with it as well so that's one thing to definitely I've got to pep my game up on in on the spring so great um Tracy offered a really wonderful comment um she just said it's nice to know and she's glad she signed up for this webinar so kudos to our three hosts today for sharing such wonderful content um she did share that she feels a little bit nervous and I, I hope it's okay that I'm sharing this Tracy but um the reason why I wanted to share this was um she said I hope I can learn this and then teach these programs so for those that may not be as familiar with some of these platforms or do they're doing this for the first time um do any of you have any um, tips or tricks or just general advice um, if people are feeling nervous or not sure um, of how to start implementing these tools. I'll start with this one. Um, one thing that I stress to a lot of educators at my school, because I feel like a lot of them have that mentality, you know, this year they're so busy. How do you make that time to teach all the content and to learn new tech tools? Find one thing, like choose one thing from everything we presented today. Take time to learn it and just stick with that one thing that you're good at maybe eventually integrate something else. But I think you're going to find that it takes a little time the first time to learn it, to share it with your students, but they're going to jump in and they're going to pretty much do the work for you and you will be amazed. Um, I know when I taught fifth grade, I didn't integrate all this stuff right away, um, but I picked one tool, I stuck with it. And I think that was just huge. Um, so that's just my advice to you. I just echo what Jen said. I think you have to find one thing. There are so many tools out there that you could use. And I don't want you to think that you have to go away with all of them um, because that's not going to be the most engaging piece for your kids either. So pick one that's versatile. Flipgrid is a great place to start because it can be a very simple platform for video and it can evolve into so much more and using something like the discovery library with Flipgrid and you can add Ozobots to it and you can have your students sharing what they're doing with code and all of the different ideas, but some, a platform like Jamboard or Flipgrid that are so versatile, I think that's one place to start and start small and give yourself grace. I think that grace piece is huge during this time and not being afraid to do it in front of your kids too. I mean, I will tell kids like, hey, this is the first time we're going to do it. We're going to try it. I'm going to learn alongside of you. And I think we sometimes get scared that they're going to judge and they're not at all. They're going to be like, Mrs. Jones, you pre just press right there. And they're teaching you what to do as you're going along. So I think we just have to let go of that a lot of times. 
Um, and it's hard because we want everything to be perfect. So, and your modeling growth mindset. I mean, I thought that was always a powerful message I wanted to send to my students is I might not know everything I'm learning too, and it might not be perfect. And that's so important for students to hear. Sorry, just chime in and on my, my thoughts there. That's all. I mean, I couldn't, yeah. couldn't agree more with that. And just speaking of like teaching them coding and going into that, they need that growth mindset and we have to have going into anything in this world, we need that growth mindset. So I think it starts and it's so important to teach them at a young age and to model it. Okay, Jessica, sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. I was just going to agree with everything, like you said, and, and just telling them up front, Hey, I, I've worked with this, but I'm going to make a mistake. I, I, you know, there it's an inevitable, you know, there will be something that you can do better than this, do better than I am on this. And, and that just, that gives them a little pep up anyway, you know, Hey, let me see if I can, can do a little bit better. So, um, just, just go with it. And, and like both of y'all said, or all three of you said, just start with one thing, you know, and, and, then you can move forward. So just don't overwhelm yourself. You can do it. Great. Thank you all for your insights. And um, with that, I'm going to jump into the giveaway. And what we did for the audience, if you don't know, um, when you filled out that form, it inserted you into a Google form. And uh, I'm actually going to ask each of the participants um, uh, to say a number zero through 10, and then I will try to mentally add those numbers together and we'll come up with the answer. But I will tell you my mental math skills are not the best, so I might need someone to cross check me. So um, Nikki, she says three, Jennifer, what number? One, so that's, we're at four, and then Jessica, two, so that is six. Did I get that? The number six, thank you. So we, uh, number six would be Kayla Thurman. You have won the educator entry kit. Uh, so congratulations, uh, Kayla. If you could email Cassandra at ozabot.com, um, she will get that educator entry kit out to you. So congratulations. Um, I just wanted to wrap up this webinar by saying, again, all of these materials will be available after the webinar, as soon as we get it processed and um, up on the internet. So you can always come back to our webinar page and access the recording and um, the slide deck. If you need a PD certificate, you can email support at ozabot.com. And um, there are also uh, the Twitter handles for each of our three panelists today in case you wanna get into direct contact with them. I wanna thank Nikki, Jennifer, and Jessica Thank you so much again for taking time to share all of these um, resources. They volunteered to spend their hour with us. And um, I want to thank everyone in the audience for being engaging and asking really great questions. So have a wonderful um, week, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. And we hope um, you have a great day. Kayla, um, I see you have an email. Uh, you have a question. You need to email Cassandra at ozabot.com. And I think she just put that into the chat. So. I'll let, uh, I'll keep the meeting going um, just so to ensure that you got that down. Um, but for everyone else, feel free to um, say your goodbyes and we will talk to you all soon. Bye everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.